Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Sherry. They experienced that before, me experiencing that the first time. So thank you very much. I would like to stick with a tradition, and that is one which I heard that Lois W. always did before she spoke, and that is, and I invite you to join me, and that is to pause and invite the power of the God of your understanding to join this time. Amen. Thank you. It was, I guess, late August, early September when Keith approached me after our meeting and he said, hey, what are you doing October 5th? And several things ran through my head, one of which I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow, let alone October. And then curiosity struck and I asked him, well, why are you asking? Well, we're having a convention in in October and we need an Al-Anon speaker. Would you be available? Well, I had made an agreement with the God of my understanding, whom I call God, that any time I had the opportunity to speak about Al-Anon or to be of service, that I, the answer was going to be yes, if it worked with my calendar, and my sponsor agreed it would be a good thing. So the following week, I said, hey, yes, I'm available October 5th, sounds great, Saturday, what exactly and who exactly am I speaking to? And he rattled something off, and I totally didn't get what he said. But that's okay, I was going to speak, and it was Saturday, and I'm thinking, well, most conventions start on Friday, it's Saturday at 5, conventions end on Sunday. Hey, you know, that's a pretty cool spot, right before the keynote speaker. So, you know, I was feeling pretty good. And a week later, he comes back and says, well, the committee met, and they've moved the Al-Anon speaking spot to Friday at 4.30, and oh, by the way, no one will be there. <laughs> I laugh because my God allows me to walk my program with humility. And once again, I am happy to be here. I'm thrilled that you are here. And even if it had been me and one other person, I would be just as excited to be here. I still didn't know what this Nikki Paw was. So I asked my sponsor to tell me, well, what's Nikki Paw? Because you see, I have a dog. Her name's Nikki, and she has paws. So I couldn't get the Nikki Paw thing at all. And she told me what, who you are, and she said, i got to warn you, they're pretty wild. But they're wild in a safe way, so feel at ease. So with that, let's move into my experience, strength, and hope. I am the oldest and only daughter of three children. I have no earthly idea why my parents married. They were the opposite in so many ways. My dad was raised in the southeast. My mom was raised in the Northwest. My dad was an introvert. My mom was an extrovert. My dad was a saver. My mom was a spender, reckless spender. So I was raised in extremes. Can't see my notes. So what I realize now after being in Al-Anon is what the attractor factor for the two of them was, is that my mom was an adult child of an alcoholic, and my dad was raised by an adult child of an alcoholic. I didn't grow up with alcoholic raging in my home, but I had all the isms all over the place. I was the firstborn, and I learned how to be a very good firstborn. I learned very quickly that if I showed up, looked neat, tidy, and quiet, that I would be accepted. That if I worked hard, and any job worth doing was worth doing to excellence, not just to get the job done. And so I was a pretty intense perfectionist. And what I learned in Al-Anon is to ask questions like, how important is it really? 
And is good enough good enough? And do I really need to be focused on this right now, or can it wait? And I have had Al-Anon friends share with me, because I would push through to make things happen in my world. Push, 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 push. Make it happen. And that resulted in a lot of frustration, a lot of intensity in my life, and it manifested itself in many ways. And now I kind of approach it as, you know, God, I can't, you can, it's yours. And I give a lot more over to the God of my understanding. When my brothers and I were growing up, my dad worked two jobs. He worked shifts for one job, the main job. And then he, he was a photographer by hobby, and he wanted to really grow that and develop that. But when he was on shifts during the day, we had to be very quiet. And my mom would plop my brother and I, my brother, youngest brother was just a baby, in front of the TV. And yes, it was a black and white TV, but boy, could we plug into it. So we would tune in and tune out. And I'm sure in the back of the house, there were a lot of arguments that we were never aware of, but they were happening. That laid a groundwork that had a huge impact on my life as an adult. Five years ago, my dad passed away. And I was his caregiver in the last stage of his battle with cancer. And my brothers came in to be a part of that. I had the longest time with my dad, and then my middle brother, and then my youngest brother, which was really reflective of the time we had with our dad when we were young, because my parents divorced when I was 12. And by that time in our lives, there had been a lot of healing in my relationship with my dad. Um, we had been estranged for almost 23 years. And we had probably about four or five years of reconciliation that was an amazing walk to be a part of and to see and experience healing at the level that it came. And that was all pre-Alanon. But during that time, after my dad passed away, my brothers and I decided that we would just stay together and go ahead and clean out my dad's house. We were all from out of town. And while we were there, we'd just do it and get it done. So my middle brother and I, we're a little on the workaholic side of the world, and we would just push and plug through the boxes, sorting pictures and doing all of that. And at the end of a long, hard day, which was a lot of emotion tied in around it, my youngest brother would come and say, okay, we got to quit, you know, we need to eat, and it's just like, let me finish this box or let me sort these tools. And then after a while, we would hear the TV. And my brother and I, within five minutes, would be standing in front of the TV totally glued in to whatever was on the TV. And my brother would flip the TV off, well, remote control the TV off, and he says, now that I have your attention, the day is done. It is time to eat and relax. And my brother and I would look at one another the first time that happened and just busted out laughing. We were clueless to how impactful TV was in our lives. Now, we would observe it whenever we would get together as a family and someone cut the TV on. He and I would just, wherever the TV was, that's where we went. And family members would tease us about it, but, you know, it was no big deal. Just, you know, the way we were. About two years ago, I went through, well, it's three years now, I went through um, a really life-changing situation occurred in my life. And for the first time in my life, I found myself living all by myself. There was a lot of hurt. There was a lot of pain, suffer, suffering, rising up, and a lot of baggage from the past. And I would push my way through the day at work, and I would come home on the way home from work, and I'd think about, you know, 45-minute TV program, supper, and go to bed early. Well, I would sit down and watch, you know, Gilmore Girls. What's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it would be hmm, three, four, five episodes later before I was dragging myself off the couch and heading to bed and berating myself. How do you do this? You're going to be exhausted tomorrow at work. What do, why do you keep doing this, Sherry? And the next morning I get up. I'm not doing that today. I'm coming home from work. I'm watching one episode, and I'm going to bed. Well, you can all guess how the pattern goes. Months later... 
I just casually mentioned to my sponsor that I thought I might be watching too much TV and it might be causing me some problems, but, you know, I think I've got it under control, nothing really big, but what did she think about it? And she says, well, you know, you're going through some hard times. Just be gentle on yourself. Be kind on yourself. You might want to book in, call, make an Al-Anon program call before and after, just so that someone has some accountability around that. Well, I wasn't going to do that. I didn't want anyone to know how much TV I was watching. So I said, okay, sure. <laughs> well, eight months later, it was a real problem. By then, I was pulling a couple of all-nighters watching TV, and it was always the series of whatever was a 45-minute program. And after eight months, um, my body was really showing the fatigue. Uh, my performance at work was really dropping off. And I began to recognize that I might just have a problem. So I called my sponsor and I said, I think I really have an addictive problem with the TV. I can't just watch one program and I'm not quite sure what to do with this. So she talked me through some options of, well, you know, you're rewarding yourself with TV. Let's come up with some other things. And I went, okay, I don't have any other ideas because I lived in extremes. And I didn't know anything in between. And so she listed off a couple of things that I could do. You know, walk with my dog would be nice. You know, find a really good book you could immerse yourself in. Well, I can do all-nighters reading books, too, so that wasn't an option for me. Um, maybe, you know, just calling someone and hanging out for a while, um, finding a, a hobby that you enjoy. And what that did, it began to help me raise that awareness. And then she says, you know what? I would really like for you to think about applying the first tradition to that. We all know the first tradition, but I get things all scrambled up, so I'm just going to read it. Um, our common welfare should come first. Personal progress for the greatest number depends upon unity. And her questions that she suggested that I asked myself before I actually watched TV. How will this help me? How will I feel after I watch TV. Will this create more unity with myself and God? And will it yield good results? That was the beginning of a huge shift in my life. Because it was very important. My relationship with my higher power, with God, previously before Al-Anon, was a punitive God. I could never quite measure up to the standard that I felt like it would be that, that my God would bless my life. And I was building a new relationship with my higher power, and that was very important to me. And I wanted sanity. I wanted to be able to have all of this nasty thinking in my head to stop. I was extremely critical of myself. I could never be that perfect Sherry that lived in my head. And I tried awfully hard and always came up short. So with the tradition, um, I slipped a couple of times, quite a few times actually, getting started. But what it did for me is it raised my awareness. So that if I started in and say, okay, I'm going to watch one program, well, 20 minutes into that program, I checked in with myself. You know what? I was not tired. Not tired at all. And I was before I started watching TV. And I have chronic pain. It wasn't hurting. Not at all. In fact, I felt pretty good. You know, I could figure out what was going on in the TV world. And I was, I, I could see a lot of detail and a lot of retention on anything that I see visually like that. In my day to day life, that's another story. And so I began to realize that it was a numbing. And so for me, it was a drug, and it was an addiction, and it was not serving me at all. And I had to invite my higher power into those moments. So I put a sign on my TV that said, not good for you, and does this draw you closer to God? So when I'd go to turn on the TV thinking that I could handle one TV program, it was just enough to make me stop and think of that tradition and think of what was the outcome of watching this program. And I was able to walk away from it. 
one night, I remember I was getting ready to walk my dog, and I was uh, I was going to do just one program. It's been a couple of months. I felt like I could do one program. And I had the TV all set on Netflix for one of those 45-minute programs. Had it set in prime, so I'd go walk the dog, and I'd come back in. And, and, you know, I got outside the door, and I had to actually go back in, turn the TV off, flip the sign back down over the TV to remind myself, this was not good for me. And that was the beginning of a huge change because then I used that time to read Al-Anon material, to spend more time with my God of my understanding, and transformation started taking place. My daughter came home from college a couple of months after that, and our quality time has always been a funny TV program or a funny movie, and we just sit and enjoy that together. And I knew that's what she'd want to do. Um, and that was considered really special time for her. But it was also a testing for me. Well, I sat there. We watched that movie. We laughed. I turned the channel off, got up, and left the room. I had never done that before. I always said, let's just watch one more movie. It won't hurt. Let's just do another program. And then I knew that I was on a good road and a good path for me. I would like to read just for a moment from Courage to Change on uh, February 26th. We all make mistakes, but hopefully as we apply al program and continue to grow in self-awareness, we will learn from those mistakes. The greatest obstacle to this learning process is shame. Shame is an excuse to hate ourselves today for something that we did or didn't do in the past. There is no room in a shamed filled mind for the fact that we did our best at the time, no room to accept that as human beings we're bound to make mistakes. If I feel ashamed, I need a reality check because my thinking is probably distorted. Even though it may take great courage, if I share about it with an Al-Anon friend, I will interrupt the self-destructive thoughts and make room for a more loving, nurturing point of view. With a little help, I may discover that even my most embarrassing moments can bless my life by teaching me to turn in a more positive direction. And the thought for today was, today I will love myself enough to recognize shame as an error in judgment. The ultimate lesson of all of us, all of us have to learn is unconditional love, which includes not only of others, but our, of ourselves as well. And that's a quote from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. You see, I inherited uh, what I now call a gift from my dad. And we both shared, shared dyslexia. My mom had no learning disabilities, and so therefore she did not get mine. Um, it was try harder, use the dictionary to figure out how to spell your words. Now, I can't hear phonetically. That's part of my dyslexia. I don't hear sounds very well, and I flip them in my mind. So as a second grader trying to look up a spelling word, pretty frustrating. Study longer. You just need to study harder and longer. So I spent a lot of time in my room studying. Didn't make a difference. I figured out how to get through school. I figured out how to not bring home low scores like 20s and 30s. I was a very creative cheater. My last name was at the end of the alphabet, so I always said in the back of the class, that is not where you want a child that has learning disabilities is in the back of the class. But that's how I managed to make passing grades, and that's all I wanted. I wanted that heat off from my parents, so that I could just barely get by, and that was how I was going to make it through school. Eventually, I did figure out how to study and what studying looked like for me, and it did require a lot of extra hours in my room or the library to make it through school. When I was 16, I had my learner's permit. My parents were divorced at this point, and my youngest brother not only got the dyslexia, but he has ADHD as well. Now, back then, we didn't know what that was. But there were learning centers starting to pop up, and my mom knew my brother had problems, and he, she needed some help with him. I had my learner's permit, learning center. I was going to drive and take them to the consultation. Well, it was a big group gathering thing. My brother went through his assessment, and then the 
presiding individual was talking to the group about what a child who has dyslexia goes through at school and what that looks like. Well, for the first time in my life, I heard someone describe what my day in school was like. Up until that point, there were so many years that I really believed that I had a brain tumor and no one was telling me. I knew there was something wrong with me and they just weren't telling me. So I nudged my mom and I said, Mom, they're talking about me. That's exactly the way I am. Well, I won't forget this moment, but I have forgiven this moment. She looked at me and she said, Sherry, this is not about you. This is about your brother. And I got a message that said, Sherry, your voice does not count and you keep your secret to yourself. And I carried that for a long time. I carried that shame that I just read for a long time so that I could never receive a compliment because I knew what I was really like on the inside. And if you knew what I had done to get through school, you would not like me. And so it was very difficult for me to receive anything that was complimentary to me. So that self-talk was pretty nasty. When I came into Al-Anon and came into the rooms of Al-Anon and heard people sharing their experiences, I felt at home. I, I, I knew what they were talking about. They were inside my head. I had no idea how they got in there and how they could know what it was like. And from that and wanting to have what they had, wanting to have what they had in those rooms of Al-Anon, I made the commitment that this was where I needed to be. This past year, I have stopped calling my brain the brain. I now associate it as a part of who I am and how I am. It doesn't define me. It's just a part of how I am. I accept that it takes me longer to get things done. It takes me longer sometimes to process things. Other times, I get pretty quickly on some stuff. And that's just the way it is. So I'm learning how to adapt. I'm learning how, if I say I can get something done in 30 minutes, with help of my sponsor, we're now doubling that. So that gives me 60 minutes. And that's more realistic. Because Perfect Sherry still says, oh, you can do it in 30 minutes. But reality doesn't work out like that. So it reduces the frustrations that I have. As I came into Al-Anon, and as Keith mentioned, I got a sponsor right away. I heard that was a good thing to do. And these people could laugh, and I wanted to laugh. And so I was going to do whatever anyone said was the right thing to do. So it was a good thing that first meeting that I went to, that I heard them say go to six meetings or more before you decide whether Al-Anon is for you or not, because I never would have gone back to another meeting if I had not heard that. Because these people in that room, they had some problems. I mean, they've been going for 17 years, and they're still there. Obviously, the program doesn't work. But you know what? That is the joy, is that now I can't wait to say I've been in Al-Anon for 17 years. Uh, that is walking out a life that I want. And so I am growing through working with my sponsor. I am stepped up into service. The first service position I took in our Al-Anon um, home group was a secretary. <laughs> Joke me, dyslexia secretary. But you know that iPhone really works well when you have permission to record for transcribing purposes only. And that was a role I really enjoyed um, serving. And now I serve as our group, group's um, group representative. So how did I come to Al-Anon? Well, it was my therapist. Thought it would be a good idea that I had a lot of relationship issues. And she thought Al-Anon would be the place for me. So I went back and did a little inventory of every significant male that was in my life, back to the first puppy love, to the last marriage. Everyone, everyone, either a soon-to-be alcoholic, was an alcoholic, an adult child of an alcoholic, and I did not go seeking these people. But boy, could I rescue. Didn't work very well either. And my mother, um, she is an expert. She's an expert in every subject you might bring up. Anything you know, she knows more. <laughs> and 
It hit the pivotal point when I turned 50, and she informed me that I was not a good daughter. And I realized that this relationship had some problems. And so I took two years away from my mom and had no interaction with her at all. My family didn't understand what was going on. I just knew that I could not do this anymore with her the way it was. There was a lot of hurt. And I reply, um, I don't get too mean. I get what I call snarky. And my snarkiness can have quite a bite. And that was not working well. It wasn't working for how well how it made me feel, and it certainly wasn't working with the impact it had on her either. During that two years is when I found Al-Anon. And I worked the steps, did my fourth step, fifth step, sixth step, seventh step, talked with my sponsor, could not quite do amends with my mom. I tried. I wrote it out. And it always came across somehow I ended up pointing my finger at her. And I said, I, I can't do an amends like that with my mom. So I decided to do a living amends with her. Uh, I had determined I wanted a relationship with her. It just was not going to be the relationship that it had been in the past. And it needed to be redefined. And I wasn't quite sure how that was going to be, but I knew that we had to have boundaries. And she was never going to change, and I had to come to terms with that. She was always going to be the expert. She was not going to be that loving, caring, compassionate mother that my heart longed for. And I had to grieve that mother that my heart longed for and let her go. And it wasn't until I could let her go, let my heart grieve, that I could move into forgiveness. And once I moved into forgiveness, I could start letting go of all those things in the past because I would play them over and over in my head of how I would have said it differently, how I would have done it differently. And I recognize that forgiveness, it's really letting go of the hope of creating something different in the past so that I could build what would be going forward a new relationship. So I use the analogy, that's concrete, set, hard, can't crack it. What I'm walking in today is soft pliable concrete. I get to shape it and mold it what it wants to be. The future, they're just the boards in the ground waiting to have concrete poured into them. So it helps me to live in the present. So when I started doing my living amends with my mom, it started off with five-minute phone calls, and they were always five minutes before I got to a destination, doctor's office, meeting a friend. They always had an end point. And I'd start the conversation, got five minutes, mom. And then I would get off the phone and I would be a not mess. And I'd call my sponsor. I tried. I ended it like I said I would. But she still got me. So for two years, I have worked with this relationship with my mom. And it, it's grown where I can have a longer conversation with her. I always had the cutoff point. That's just the boundary I've defined as necessary with her. With her. And when I would go visit her, which wasn't very often, but when I got to the point where I would go visit with her, I always had another family member with me, and it was always 24 to 48 hours no more. And then I would come home and decompress with my sponsor and work through the things that I could do differently in the future. Well, two months ago, I went by myself on a solo visit with my mom, and on my ride back of after two and a half days with her, I called my sponsor, and I'm going, ah, I did it. She tried to push those buttons, and they just didn't work. Because what had happened is I had my mom here, and there was a space between us now. And I could see what she was doing. And I could choose, eh, don't think I want to pick that one up. Nah, let that one fall away. Ah, I'll make a comment. Thanks, Mom. I appreciate that. And it was so much fun. And then I went back with my daughter um, because my mom's health is, heal is um, declining. And we went back to look to see if there was anything we needed to do that can help her and whether there was a possibility that I might need to move closer to her. And I had talked that through tightly with my sponsor and my daughter, and we were praying, asking God to show us, is this the time, Is this? do I need to, to live closer to her? And my grandmother, who's 95, is still living. That's a dynamic. I won't go into that one. <clears throat> and we, we had a great visit. And I came back. No, don't feel God moving me in that direction at all. And 
that's kind of fun to see and know that some point in the future, I will have a relationship where I can be of service to my mom and I can love and care for her in a loving, compassionate way. Whether she chooses to engage with that or not, I'm okay with it. And that's all directly the results of my work with my Al-Anon program. So working the three A's, awareness, acceptance, and action. I love awareness. I have learned that awareness is all about no judgment. It just is. Just like that wall. Oh, that wall is gold. How about that? That's it. That's awareness. That's fun to apply that in my life. Oh, I just said that. Well, how about that? (laughs) And then acceptance. Acceptance is just, it is what it is, you know? The cool thing is, is the action. And sometimes for me, no action is action. And that's a lot of action sometimes for me. But the power of choice. I remember the day when I was talking with my sponsor, and she made the comment to me about choice and in regards to my thoughts. And she said, Sherry, you know, just because your thoughts go down a trail doesn't mean you have to go after them. I never thought about that. I went wherever my thoughts went, and they went to some pretty yucky places, pretty intense judgmental places, pretty dark, gloomy places. And I always thought I went wherever they went. And that was an aha day for me. And that's when I started realizing the power of choice. That I can choose not to go down that path. I can choose not to chew the cud like a cow over something someone said to me. I could just let it go. That was powerful. And it's been powerful in my working my program. And I love in all our affairs this quote. We may never have the choice we would have if we had written the script, but we always have choices. Sometimes I get to restart my day. If I don't like the way things are going and I recognize that my thoughts are in nasty places, I get to just hit that restart button and restart the day. And I do it a lot by applying the first step. And I'll just go that um, I admitted that I am powerless over whatever is happening. Because if I don't admit that I'm powerless over it, that I'm going to be crazy in my head trying to fix it, solve it, create a solution around it. And it just is so much easier to admit that I'm powerless over it. Every morning I get up and I make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. And I get down on my knees and I say, God, I give you my will and my life for today, my thoughts and my words to you. And I can tell days when I get into the day and I forgot to do that because all of a sudden I become aware that things aren't quite going so well in my head. And so if I can't get on my knees, because that's part of my walking in humility and that's part of me owning my um, humanity, I will mentally get on my knees and turn my life and my will over to the care of God And those people that are in my life that I care for, that I used to give God these long lists of things that if you'll do this, they'll be great. You know, if I can help, I'm glad to. And sometimes I'm over here helping to fix them. And, oh, God, by the way, if you could join me, that would be wonderful. Now my prayer is as simple as I pray for the knowledge of God's will for them and the courage for them to carry it out. That's it. And I feel like those prayers are so much more powerful than anything I ever tried in the past. I have two uh, adult children. My son is Caleb and lives in Brooklyn in New York. And my daughter just graduated from Appalachia State in Boone. And she's still up in Boone. Love that area. Doesn't want to leave. Don't blame her. This program has restored my relationship with my children. I was a pretty intense mom, and I was going to be the best mom there ever was. Uh, I was a pretty frustrated mom and took a lot of those frustrations out on my firstborn, Caleb. 
And through this program and the beauty of these steps and working amends, um, I have an awesome kid. We have great conversations. I allow myself three questions anytime I encounter a, a conversation with him and no more. And they're not yes or no answered questions either. <laughs> I give him a chance to open up and tell me whatever he wants to share with me and just tell him how much I love him. And I will hang up the phone and say, you know, I really got to go. I try to keep them really short. And I knew that our relationship had made a lot of progress when he said, hey, Mom, do you really have to go? Can't you talk a little bit longer? I was like, yeah. Huge, huge. And my daughter, I see her more often than I see my son. And we are learning to change our dance steps. Now, she's the four generations. So she sees great-grandma, grandmama dynamic. She's seen and been a part of the her grandmother and my dynamic. And she's watched me change how I interact with my mother. And she's seen me and heard me make the commitment that I am not carrying on that generational way of interaction. It stops here. The two of us, we're changing the direction that it goes. And so she's learned to have a voice. She's learned to express to me, hey, Mom, I think you're pretty intense right now. And I listen to her. We had the opportunity to be on a trip, just the two of us, as a gift that my brother gave me, gave us when we were in San Diego two weeks ago. And we got to drive up the coastal Highway 1 from San Diego up to just below L.A. Well, actually above L.A., just below San Francisco. And um, (laughs) it was great. We had a lot of quiet time in the car, and that was okay. We were both really okay with quiet. I wasn't trying to force conversation. And then she'd open up and we'd talk about some things. And I was able to let her own her stuff and just say, "Mm, okay, that's yours, not mine. And let it be. It's wonderful. And that is a direct response back to this program. I would not have the relationship that I have with family members today if it was not for Al-Anon. The power of gratitude. You know, I had to hear in Al-Anon people talk about making a gratitude list, and yeah, that sounds great. And I would do it, you know, because they said do it. I would do it. In August, well, let me go back just a little bit. So I'm going to come back to gratitude in just a moment. This was an unusual year for me. I had a lot of caregiving. Uh, my sister-in-law found out she had breast cancer in February, and I had the honor and the flexibility with my work to go spend four weeks with them after her surgery. They homeschool, and there are my only two nieces and a nephew out there. So I stepped into their world. Now, I grew up with my brother, so I get my I totally get my brother. And into their home, I was blessed because of this program to be a service. I, I can come across strong, and I try to come across soft. We had to um, have a schedule, and I didn't always do it well, but I tried to do it. And when I did do it a little bit harshly, I would come back, you know, step 10, make amends right away, admit that I'd made an error, that I came across maybe a little bit too intense, a little bit too hard. And it was a privilege to be a part of that household for those four months. In May, my aunt, who is my dad, was my dad's last um, living sibling, had been my mom. She had been my mentor growing up. She had been a spiritual mentor to me. She had been the wings beneath my cells. I loved this woman. She was a dear, dear friend. And we found out in May that she had cancer that was going to be her final battle. And she raised three boys. And so I was her daughter niece. So all of us came together in the wives, and we made a commitment that we would be with her, and this was pretty aggressive cancer that there would be a family member with her at all times. I'm telling you, in intensity and grieving before the loss of someone, there's a lot of emotions that can be all over the place. And it was amazing to walk that out with my cousins and to be able to apply my program. I went to meetings while I was there. I had program calls that I could step away and make those program calls to reconnect with people here in Durham. And it allowed me to live 
and let live. It allowed me to share from my experience of being the caregiver for my dad to my cousins without telling them how to do something and without trying to control everything. That was a gift of this program. In August, after coming back from her memorial, and I worked two jobs. My day job, I worked in a small company with a woman, um, just three women together, and that was a great business. And then uh, I had another second job, and the owner worked with me, under me, in my second business. Well, that horizon totally changed, and I found that in August, that first of September, I would no longer be um, working with her because the the vision had changed for the business. So I'm grieving my aunt. I'm grieving the loss of a job. I'm grieving the loss of a shift in my second job. And this woman that I worked with was a dear friend. And so I was upset. I was angry. Uh... What's my future look like? I didn't think I had a plan, and all of a sudden I realized, oh, I did have a plan for the future. And all of it has come about, I think, because at the beginning of the year, I kind of said, you know, God, I've really messed up a lot of things in my past, and I've forced a lot of solutions that were not the right solution. So I am stepping into this year, and I'm willing to go where you want me to go, to live each day at a time, and to have a life of purpose with life with laughter in it as well. In August, I was not doing a lot of laughing. It was a very heavy, hard month for me because I had some character traits surface, like envy. Boy, I didn't realize I had that much envy in me. And anger and disappointment, disillusionment. And it was causing a problem with my friend. And I made a decision keeping to Tradition 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles above personalities. The principle was our friendship. That really mattered to me. Really mattered to me. Personalities, that was all that character trait, yuck, that was floating to the top. And after three weeks... I um, realized that, you know what, she just needed to know what she, her decision, what impact they had had on my life, and I needed to let her know that. And so I was all ready to have a conversation with her, and I, I can always hear my sponsor in the background saying, Sherry, before you speak or before you take action, always think it through to see whether you might have to make an amends on the other side of it. And I'm thinking, this has a feel of an amends to me, so I called my sponsor, couldn't get a hold of her, so I got a hold of my uh, service sponsor, and she shared an experience that, you know, if you just take the time and write out everything you want to say, and then read it back to your sponsor, then you can know whether you're saying what you really need to say, or whether something else is going on. Well, I wrote everything out. I mean, I wrote it out. And I realized, you know what? Uh, this is really a lot of judgment, a lot of judgment in everything I had to say. And I already had done that little dance with judgment, and I knew that was not my place, and that was God's, and that was not mine. So I, I stepped out of that judgment. I just, whoop, nope, not, not going there. But I'm left with all these emotions. And so I said, God, what do I do with all of these emotions? Um, if I can't dump them on her, what do I do with them? Well, forgiveness, forgiveness. Wow, okay. Well, God, um, I choose to forgive, and I ask that you work in my heart to work it out. And throughout the weekend, I was able to let that mess go because you know what? I asked God to work in my life to make me a better, healthier person, and what was this all about? Boiling up the yuck in me and getting a chance to scrape it off to be a better person as a result. And so by Monday morning, man, that everything had broken. It was good. I felt good about my friend, and I couldn't wait to go talk to her. I called her up, asked her if she could have time to meet with me, and, I, and, I, and my amends to her was I put distance between us during the month of August intentionally because I didn't want to say or do anything that would damage our friendship. 
And I just want you to know that's why I distanced myself from you. And that's all I needed to say. And then she opened up, and then we had the most amazing conversation. And I sat back and I laughed, and I said, you know, you thought this decision was all about you. It wasn't. It was all about me. It was all about what God wanted to work in my life through this situation. And she opened up and shared what God was working in her life. And it hadn't anything to do with me. Nothing at all to do with me at all. And that relationship is restored. All because of keeping to a tradition. Her friendship mattered. I'd like to close with Hope for Today from March 6th. One of the reasons this program works so well is that we don't all experience our insane times at once. The alcoholic isn't sick in all areas of life at all times, and neither are we. We come together to tell a story of healing by sharing our experience, strength, and hope. We share. We join our stories together to paint a deeper, truer picture of the family disease of alcoholism. When we share true thoughts and feelings, we let each other know that no one takes the recovery journey alone. Experience. We each have survived the effects of alcoholism. By sharing what we have lived through ourselves, we provide opportunities for others to identify with our experiences and to dispel their feelings of uniqueness. When we relate how we've applied the Al-Anon program to our problems, We give each other concrete ideas to take home and to use. Strength. By allowing others time to tell their stories, we forge a mutual unified support stronger than any one of us alone. We learn to let the collective support of the group sustain us. Hope. At times when we feel the insanity of the disease, we hear those who are saner. Even during our darkest times, there is usually a member whose path is even darker. As we reach out to those members, we rediscover the hope we thought we had lost. Thought for today. Recovery cannot occur in isolation. Together we can accomplish what we cannot do alone. By sharing what I have to say and listening to what others have to say, I learn how to deal with some of my problems, living today in Alateen. So I keep coming back. I keep coming back because I want this program to be there for other people. I serve because we need service. And it gives me an opportunity to really work my program and to learn and be a part of a bigger, pro- a bigger, what? A bigger, what? Solution. Thank you. That's part of my dyslexia too. You get to fill in the blanks every now and then. <laughs> I have a sponsor. I work tightly with my sponsor. I have a service sponsor as well. I make program calls. I love program calls. I hated making them when my sponsor first told me to start making them. I did it because she said to. Now I'm grateful that she encouraged me to make those program calls. And it's it's a blessing to know for me because what I don't know, it's okay because God knows it. And I don't have to know everything. I do not want to just exist and get by in this life. I want a full life. I want one filled with laughter. I am learning how to laugh and have fun. And you're helping teach me how to do that. And I thank you for that. Thank you for the privilege of being here. And thank you for being here. And I hope that what I've said somehow, some way, blesses you, encourages you. If not, just leave it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.